opening slide, it's the wonderful uh, watercolour drawing uh, uh, of the uh, Goddards, uh, which uh, they kindly let us uh, use for the front cover of uh, transactions recently as well, a view before the, uh, the alterations in uh, 1821. Everything uh, working okay? All right. So, um, just a, a reminder, I'm sure I'm probably speaking to a uh, audience who are, are we okay? Not, I'll project, I'll project a bit more for the audience. I, I'm pretty good at projecting. Yeah. Okay, um, so um, pretty familiar, I'm sure, to, uh, to most of you uh, what, um, in the audience, in the hall and uh, watching otherwise, but uh, this uh, view, uh, which Neil Finn took from uh, the uh, church uh, tower looking down on the hall. It is really quite a surprise, this building, because although it, uh, it looks uh, uh, far later of date and maybe less interesting from the outside here, inside um, as uh, has been suspected for a long time and we can now be confident is the case it is uh, the earliest standing Isle Hall in England it really is a hugely important building and uh, the research we're going to be going through tonight is just exploring that and uh, and finding the uh, the way uh, ways in which it is quite remarkable um, it's based on this uh, article that uh, uh, you may have seen in Leicestershire Transactions uh, just um, two or three years ago, um, so there's lots more detail there if you want to uh, pursue it further. Um, and of course it's also based on a great deal of um, previous research and assistance in particular from uh, Richard Buckley in the audience tonight and uh, from uh, ULAS who uh, carried out excavations and earlier researches as well that I'll be bringing in uh, just the location map, which again is probably su superfluous for the current audience, but this uh, remarkable sort of green heart, which contains this uh, historic heart, but really very unexpected and uh, unsuspected really, I think for many, many people who come to Leicester without particularly thinking of it as a historic town, that it has this remarkable historic core with the castle right at the middle. And just uh, summarizing um, the key features of the castle, we're going to be concentrating on the castle hall, but of course its whole setting is important. There's the, uh, the mock, <coughs> um, uh, the original uh, Norman Mott and Bailey Castle, though suddenly truncated in later centuries. Uh, the hall uh, groups around the castle yard, the great church of St Mary de Castro, uh, which was uh, predates even the castle hall, probably early and uh, um, mid 12th century dates. Um, John of Gaunt's cellar, which we'll be coming back to just uh, south of the Great Hall, um, Castle House and the, the gateway around there with those wonderful timber frame buildings and the uh, turret gateway. Uh, so just uh, summarising those in this uh, slide here, those are the remaining features. Um, it's uh, maybe, uh, as Leyland said, it's rather reduced as a, as a castle, but it still has uh, some really important features. Um, so uh, there we are. We'll be coming back in particular to John of Gaunt's cellar towards the end of the talk. And uh, then just to uh, summarise some of the uh, sort of key dates really from um, the documentary side, in particular in how they relate to the Castle Hall. So Motton Bailey Castle was uh, founded in 1068. Um, uh, Robert de Beaumont uh, took uh, possession of uh, the, the uh, castle site, 1107 to 18. His son then, Robert, the second Earl of Leicester, Le Bossu, um, hunchback, uh, that means they were a bit cruel with their uh, nicknames in the medieval period, were they not? Um, but he, he um, has, can now really quite confidently um, be uh, assigned to being the chief uh, builder of, uh, of the hall at Leicester. Um, he was um, uh, born, as it says there, 1118 to 1168, um, and uh, he um, became really one of the most important magnates in the country. Uh, following in the footsteps a little bit of his rather more um, um, charismatic uh, brother, elder brother Walloran, but he, he actually had a, in the end, a much more successful career, became chief uh, justicia for um, Henry II, was practically vice regent when Henry II was out of the country during his reign uh, from um, 1154 to 1189. So very much the sort of man you would expect to be um, really building something impressive as his uh, principal seat. 
Um, and that then aligns with the latest, uh, as part of this recent program of research, we were able to carry out another, there's been previous tree ring dating, but we were able to carry out another program of tree ring dating, which um, confirmed the original Isle Hall structure um, with a tree ring date of 1137 to 62. And uh, with the other stylistic and, uh, and other uh, documentary dates and, and the context that we're looking at, we can be fairly confident it's in the 1150s uh, when uh, Robert II, uh, Earl of Leicester, is really at the height of his powers. Um, there's been this question uh, for some time about uh, the rebellion uh, which happened in 1173 against Henry II and uh, the recorded destruction of the castle and throwing down of some of the castle walls. Um, and, you know, could this actually have meant that the, the castle hall had to be constructed after that date? I think we can be confident now, as people have been reasonably confident before, but with the tree ring dating in particular now, we can be very confident that's not the case and the destruction must have been to other parts of the walls um, uh, rather than the castle hall itself. Um, later history, I'll come back to a little bit about that at the end, but we uh, have uh, Simon de Montfort, of course, in the 13th century, uh, and just some sort of interesting things in terms of actual uh, notes of things to do with the castle hall itself. The first um, record of a court being held, it would certainly have been a place for both sort of feasting, uh, great ceremony and courts from very early on in its life, the Great Hall. But uh, the first record of a size court is 1273. Um, and then the later owners, of course, Henry of Lancaster, who um, expanded the site into the Newark. Uh, and it's really glory days in uh, John of Gaunt's time in the late 14th century uh, with uh, multiple royal visits. Um, and uh, then it um, became subsequently um, under Henry IV, a royal castle and one of many rather than the principal seat of um, the, uh, the noble family. So it's sort of relative importance to its family then declined along with um, so many of the other castle sites through the um, 15th and uh, 16th century it went into decline. Um, there was a parliament, uh, a major parliament, uh, the part famous for the parliament of bats where they fought each other or went in uh, with uh, bats rather than they weren't allowed in with swords so they went in with bats um, in the castle hall. Uh, rowdy lot, uh, worse than our own perhaps. Um, and uh, then finally the in 1539 uh, one of the surveys there's a series of uh, things uh, talking about the decay of the castle, the, the great castle hall itself is um, noted as being in great decay. But um, as with uh, one or two other castle halls, it owes its survival to the fact that it did have this ongoing judicial and court function. And uh, therefore, are we okay? <laughs> um, and therefore, um, it uh, survived and was kept uh, roofed and working as a, as a viable building in use, uh, unlike so many other um, of the uh, more military parts, which uh, fell out of use and then uh, became redundant. Um, so this uh, this is, uh, as, as it says there, um, Richard's uh, plan. I don't know whether this is still your current thinking, Richard, I hope so. But anyway, um, it's interesting just in particular to see the shape of the, um, the outer bailey as it's judged, best judged from the various excavations that uh, you last and others have, have conducted for so many years in and around the castle site. And the particular thing to notice, obviously, there is that the Great Hall is then built right up against the castle uh, bailey wall. Uh, the bailey was larger in that time and uh, shrunk in to uh, exclude the church later on, though expanded out southwards. Um, and here's a, a, a nice view from Nichols, which shows this very typical shape of an aisled hall with a, a very broad plan and a great sweeping roof coming down lower over the aisles, so it's quite recognisable in that, uh, that view there. Um, so back to the, um, the building itself um, and uh, this, this uh, rather um, unexpected uh, view from uh, what it looks like on, on, on the front, just to have a few um, uh, slides to remind people of, uh, of it. What we've got here is, is the east um, section of the building, the whole east front, which was refronted in 1695, and the original hall lies in behind that with the high, high roof up here. Um, <clears throat> it really is uh, quite a remarkable uh, survivor, um, the, uh, the, the castle hall, um, in that it's had uh, 
uh, major alterations, um, the whole of the, uh, the upper roof uh, replaced and uh, upper parts truncated around about 1500. Uh, the east side that we're looking at here rebuilt in 1695. Um, it was then uh, in the 19th century in two different phases of work, subdivided many of the aisle posts, the lower parts of them cut out, um, extended uh, uh, upwards and uh, additions to the south. But inside, remarkably, and still actually legible, um, just because we're able to sort of piece together from a whole number of sources, the fragmentary evidence, it is legible as our earliest uh, standing Isled Hall from the 1150s, uh, quite remarkable. Um, so that's the, the East Front, which was, I uh, won't be saying all that much about that, but that was rebuilt in 1695, um, rather nicely described by uh, Celia Fines on her journeys through Leicester as a, uh, a new pile of building, all of brick. Um, uh, she maybe didn't take much notice of what was behind this, uh, this new frontage, really, which is, uh, from our point of view, maybe rather more interesting than the, uh, the new pile of brick out the front. Um, the, uh, the west side will be coming back to this, the, the opposing side similarly has a, a large amount of, uh, of 19th century uh, brickwork in the upper parts, but as we'll be seeing, uh, does, does have uh, quite a lot of the original fabric into which you can read quite a lot to, of information down at lower level there. Um, and then um, inside this, uh, this lovely view, which uh, was was uh, put together uh, in 1821, just before major alterations then took place. So um, the, the, uh, the building was then in court use. Uh, there were two courts uh, being held here, the civil and criminal court, and they decided they really needed to separate them out. So um, a, uh, the two ends were then subdivided, a whole staircase built up the middle. So a sort of section of the building out the middle was, was lost. On the, uh, the right-hand side here, um, a wall was built up along those posts to create additional rooms out the back. Um, these uh, posts here at lower level are all cut away, so um, massive changes, um, but uh, as we say, rather extraordinarily um, part surviving. What you can see um, quite nicely here is the original um, 12th century masonry of the gable end wall, which is one of the major survivals of the original fabric. Um, so just looking at what's happened then inside, it's now, of course, been through a recent programme of work and it's the, uh, the business school, um, this is a law school, is it, um, for De Montfort uh, University, whole programme of, of refurb. And it's through that process that some of the recent archaeological excavation that uh, Ulas and Richard and other team uh, led on, and I got drawn into uh, a study of the standing building and the wider context of that, uh, very kindly invited on site by Richard when the excavations were very much in progress and uh, quite exciting times of discovering things then. So um, this is the, the, the one of the cross walls that was put in to uh, subdivide space. You can see here a wall that's been built up against some of these aisle posts which remain here. Only the very tops of the aisle posts survive and all of these have been chopped away. Um, and uh, that's maybe a little bit more evident in, in the uh, plans here on the ground floor. Um, you can see the uh, original walling marked in heavy black there. Um, the posts still survive, but they're buried within this, this wall here. There's this big slice of, uh, it's been cut through for the new staircase and entrance hall and the two courts left and right. And then at upper level, we've still got the upper parts of the other, uh, the rest of the, uh, the aisles and some of the upper parts of the walls that survive on the gable ends. Um, so that's uh, a view in one of the courts, then looking upwards, and you see here this wall that uh, in which the original 12th century post here is parked, embedded, and here there's sort of rather less of that one visible. Um, and as we'll see, the whole of this upper roof uh, has been, has turned out to be a replacement um, from uh, the uh, 1500 or so. But one of the other remarkable survivals, which uh, anyone who's visited over the years will be aware of, is this uh, amazing uh, cut-off uh, piece. It's now on display once again in, in, in the Castle Hall by De Mont on the staircase, as it used to be, uh, uh, in the De Montfort building. Um, and this is a section cut out of, uh, of one of the aisle posts of one of the, uh, the capitals with this um, rather crude um, uh, timber scallop 
uh, detail, typical sort of Norman capital, uh, and rather remarkably was preserved, clearly preserved as a sort of interesting historical artifact rather than like so much of the rest of the aisle posts uh, uh, consigned to bonfires or whatever, but uh, that has remained a, a hugely important uh, piece for figuring out the uh, these drawings uh, were studied quite closely as part of the big program of research that Richard Buckley was involved with in the 1980s with the local architect Nick Clee and he did a wonderful series of drawings including some of the uh, the capital here and the pattern of joints and in particular peg holes in that capital is really the key to understanding a whole lot of the upper structure um, and that capital also uh, has been um, tree ring dated now firmly to um, that uh, 1137 to 62 date. Um, so um, we'll uh, now uh, move on to look at um, some of the uh, timber uh, parts of the structure. The, uh, the timber um, uh, side of it was in particular quite a focus of the um, program of work that was carried out uh, and researched and published by Richard Buckley with Nat Alcock. And Nat Alcock, uh, a, a colleague I know well, who's quite a specialist in early timber frame buildings. And uh, between them, they uh, figured out a great deal about this uh, timber structure. Um, so um, I'll be going through that and then looking uh, further at the masonry side of it, which had not been studied in quite so much detail before. Um, what's turned out with the, the roof here is that there have been long arguments about the date of the roof and people had thought that it too was all very early 12th century work. In fact, the tree ring dating that was done showed and a, a better understanding really of roof structures that we have nowadays shows that this dates from the uh, around about 1500, the whole of that upper roof has in fact been replaced. Um, and that's the, uh, the tree ring dating diagram from that um, uh, research. Um, the, uh, the dating for that was revisited just recently by Nottingham tree ring dating as part of the recent research and confirmed again as 1495 to 1520. So that whole array of the sort of upper triangulated trusses is all of that date. Uh, and what survives is really of the earlier structure is just some of the, uh, the posts below, but enough to uh, be able to see with. Uh, and this is the, um, the reconstruction drawing that was put together by uh, Nat Alcock in 1987 and published in Medieval Archaeology um, and uh, very much worked out the, the upper part of the roof in particular, that it had these large curving arch braces, which will come back to my sort of... Um, uh, reconstruction of looking at that evidence uh, with a little bit more uh, of the comparables in mind and in particular this feature which really hadn't been guessed at before of a, a clear story uh, as in a church roof uh, open above uh, above the uh, arcade of the aisles throwing light into the interior of the building. Uh, and this uh, um, very nice uh, 3D drawing by Richard um, with a sort of minor update uh, that he kindly did uh, for the article in Transactions, uh, which really shows that uh, that structure uh, remarkably clearly and shows in particular how the, the arcades uh, run along the building, the aisle posts, and then standing up above the roof line, this uh, clear story uh, for which there's just a little bit of joint evidence. Um, but to, to start then with um, some of the, uh, the more recent research, this is the, uh, the most recent um, uh, tree ring dating. Um, this is Robert Howard um, from uh, Nottingham University Tree Ring Dating Lab. Um, and um, this um, foot of um, a, uh, an aisle, one of the aisle posts, um, we were able to access during the building work. It really was quite a tight little piece of access. It was involved squirming uh, quite a long way down the heating duct. And uh, Robert Howard, brave man, squirmed down there with his drill and, uh, and so on. But the great thing about this was that actually, because it's so hidden away, this post, although sort of cut off at the bottom and reworked a bit on this lower part, the upper part here actually retains the original surface finish and complete section of the original 12th century timber. Uh, so he was able to get a really good date out of that. So with that, he uh, was able to get the date and he went back to uh, also date the, uh, the uh, capital, the um, uh, 
uh, detached capital uh, with this as a comparable and was then able to get this uh, date of 1137 to 62 to really bottom out um, the dating, which was a great step forward. Um, the other part, of course, which I won't be saying very much about because it's other people's subject really, but um, accompanying the, uh, the work um, that uh, de Montfort did to uh, redevelop and, uh, and reuse the building. The North Court was, uh, the whole of the floor level was excavated uh, by ULAS and this was my recent uh, uh, visit that I had uh, back then with, uh, with, with, with Richard. Uh, the particular feature here just to um, pick out on this is, is this here which is um, from my point of view, the exciting feature really, I'm sure for archaeologists there may be all sorts of other things, but actually that is the really big significant thing because that is the um, uh, uh, post hole for the original earthfast aisle post. Um, it's here on the building, it's been sort of filled with these um, current stones, but you can see this is the end wall here, that's uh, where the ar arcade comes down, and this is the spacing, and ab directly above that is, is a cut off top of one of the aisle posts, so that's where it sat and it went down into a, 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 um, a post pit. Um, it wasn't fully excavated, unfortunately, the, the programme work didn't allow for that, um, but enough evidence there to see that clearly it had been originally uh, earthfar style post. Uh, that's really important because although um, on archaeological clear sites, um, post holes are maybe quite a regular finding, um, in terms of standing buildings, there's extremely few standing buildings, particularly early aisle buildings that have had any um, post holes, earth fast posts actually proven and, and, and delivered. Uh, as, as, as happened here, what tended to happen is they were then in later centuries cut off um, because they rotted out and a pad stone, as the evidence was here, put in here probably as part of the big works in 1500. Um, and uh, you lose all that evidence and because it's underneath an existing building, you don't usually get the chance to dig it up. But here, very excitingly able to show a, uh, a, a um, earth fast post, a post hole directly related to an in situ building hovering right above it. Um, so in terms of the, uh, the timber structure above, just uh, run through some of the details of how that goes together. Um, the, um, uh, this in particular shows uh, the two-way bracing um, on um, the, this, this here and here is the capital, that's that little fragment of a capital that we have off one of the posts and what you see here is the great big braces coming in uh, which band across the nave as it were of the Isle Hall and also along the arcade and both of those braces came down onto this, uh, this capital uh, detail here. Um, we'll come. So looking at um, the, the capital, one can then um, from that uh, trace um, from these peg holes and so on, the detail of how those, um, those braces are uh, um, jointed in. And um, one of the rather extraordinary things about um, this and something that really shows its very early date is that um, uh, if looking, for example, at uh, the way this, uh, this big curving brace down here comes in to just above the capital, they are not done as a sort of, uh, as, we, as in later centuries, with a mortise and tenon joint a, uh, socketed into the timber. It's actually a face slap joint and just sort of rather crudely face pegged uh, into the timber. Um, so that's why you've got sort of uh, peg holes, but no actual mortises for the timbers to enter into. And that's actually um, looking at the comparable examples, which are rather few and far between, but um, a number of them have now been uh, brought to light over the recent years. And um, that's very typical um, for the period. And uh, what you've got then is both the braces for the, the nave, and this is the sort of end section of um, these coming in from the arcade, coming into this one point. So you get quite a complex pattern of peg holes in that, uh, which takes a little bit of unpicking, but for sure uh, leads you very um, uh, confidently towards this reconstruction. Um, and uh, what we'll also see is uh, something that I've been adding is, um, although we don't have any evidence for the upper parts here, um, other comparables show how the, the, similarly, where it was jointed into this uh, uh, horizontal timber plate, these braces also would have been with a strange lap joint. All, uh, as, as, uh, as Cecil Hewitt uh, called this, at, uh, the comparable we'll be looking at in a bit at Hereford, 
Bishop's Palace, all very poor carpentry, really, in, in, the, in, in that sort of terms, if you want to take a sort of a technological view of it, um, it's very sort of crudely done. And this was uh, really before the, the uh, time when they had begun to develop full mortise and tenon framed carpentry. Um, but having said that, what's particularly interesting about Leicester and one of the sort of maybe rather technical points about it, it, it maybe does have uh, surviving still the evidence of one of the very first mortise and tenon joints in this country in a framed building, because um, they had a problem in that um, these great, great aisle posts were coming up. And instead of just coming up to a sort of top plate up here in one unbroken piece, because we had this arcade below and a clear story in this area here, they were having to joint into the post um, the, uh, the plates. Now they could have just lapped it across past, but that would have taken quite a chunk out of the, uh, the post. So here, although, although these, these uh, tenons now have been sort of somewhat reused, you can see some of the, uh, the detail here, um, the, uh, the, the mortise and tenon uh, probably it looks like survives from the original building of where those plates connected into the post and if that is the case it is um, as other experts have um, consulted with on it would agree it looks like it's the earliest datable um, mortise and tenon joint in a frame building in this country. Um, the, uh, this, then just looking at how the clear story works, the final bit sort of standing up above that, that seems to have been a just a, a boarded structure to let in uh, light, uh, whether it had shutters that you could uh, also close to keep the rain out when the wind was blowing. Uh, but um, you can see here, there's a very nice uh, slot, original slot uh, set into um, the side of that, and that would have taken that uh, clear story structure and, uh, and that again gives you enough evidence. Don't know exactly the height of it, but enough evidence to see that there must have been this uh, clear story structure above. So that uh, is, is some of the, um, the timber framing details. I'll come back in due course to look at the sort of overall conclusion of how the whole building uh, was put together. But um, I want to turn to the uh, masonry side of things, which is the particular part that um, hadn't been quite so closely studied and is something that I've looked at quite a lot of um, 12th and 13th century masonry buildings over the years. And uh, it's very intriguing to try and piece together once again the fragmentary evidence. Uh, having said that, you start really with this uh, most complete piece of evidence, which is the wonderful um, gable end wall, the south gable end wall with these two very fine uh, Norman windows in it, which is a very complete and very sort of high class piece of Norman masonry, which we can now say dates from the 1150s. Uh, just closing in on that, it's really uh, quite uh, nice to sort of um, see the original detail. This is the, um, the pier between those, just go back again. Go back. Yeah, it's the, uh, the pier between, we're just looking at this section here, and the pier between the two big arch windows. And you can see that the whole of that pier is, is really quite nice, um, tightly jointed ashlar masonry built of the, the local Dane Hills uh, sandstone um, with this very typical diagonal, um, rather crude um, axing dressing. Um, uh, and uh, has the, the dressed uh, stones as well uh, for the uh, other details, the string course and the capital there. Um, we'll look at um, an, another few details. The, um, there's the, the capital, uh, the, sorry, the, the column, uh, the pier base here with uh, a molded base to it. Um, the columns, one of which um, does still survive. Um, there's been quite a lot of Victorian restoration, but looking closely, you can distinguish uh, between that and the original fabric. The, uh, the, the columns here rather unusually are um, octagonal rather than the normal um, uh, circular thing, really quite a distinctive decision. And then these quite well-formed scalloped capitals, um, similar to the rather crude uh, uh, timber cut capital. And you can see that's all, all cut out of a single block, that whole capital and that with its masonry. So it's all the original thing with this very typical impost, uh, little quirk to it and so on. And then above that, again, you've got the chevron. And again, although uh, quite a lot of the chevron detail has been replaced, uh, there's plenty of the original all still there clearly to be seen. So you can be quite confident about all of the detail of that window. Rather nicely, there's a, there's a drawing in uh, Nichols' History of Leicestershire uh, of, uh, of these windows uh, to have been noted as obviously quite an important uh, building 
right back then. And the drawing remarkably actually shows it, it's very consistent if you sort of compare that with the original as against the replaced masonry. It's actually a very direct thing. So the, in Victorian times, uh, these sort of parts not shown on the drawing are largely things that had either eroded away too far or whatever had to be replaced. But actually most of um, what is shown on the drawing is the original mid 12th century work. Um, so um, that's the, the gable end there. Um, the end, that was sort of uh, quite well recognized really, obviously a very sort of striking piece of fabric. Um, I went on to look at the uh, the west uh, wall out um, towards uh, the out. Uh, this it was the wall that's built really as part of the outer bailey wall, facing out over the the castle bank and ditch and uh, and towards the river. Um, and here, rather remarkably, um, although it's really quite a big patchwork quilt of of of, of masonry, uh, once you study it closely, it becomes evident that there is again some uh, quite a lot of original masonry within this. You've got a whole plinth line and having studied the inside of that gable wall with the wonderful windows, the pattern is clear that um, the dress stone and uh, so on is all done with Dane Hills sandstone, really quite clean ashlar facing. The general walling is in a, is in a rubble walling and although quite a lot of the rubble walling here, particularly at upper level, has been replaced with a later volcanic rock, um, what's evident here is that we've got surviving this uh, stepped uh, chamfered plinth of the original building. So these main uh, courses of stepped plinth and some of the uh, dress stone between them, I'm fairly confident, is part of the original 12th century work. It, um, it has very much the same characteristics and appearance as that uh, Norman work on the interior of the, uh, the south gable. Um, and inside, uh, another feature which um, has uh, caught people's attention inside on the, uh, the first floor is this remarkable um, chevron arch inside a window. It's, it's one window, oh, sorry, um, one window that rather oddly, if you look at all the, the facade here, it's that window which still has a pointed head. And it's a window that was uh, recorded by Nichols in the 1790s again. And clearly, when they made the 19th century massive alterations and rebuilt everything in big, they thought that this was something worth keeping. Um, and uh, there it is. Um, at first, you might think that that's uh, because it's Chevron, it's, it's typical Norman sort of uh, uh, mid 12th century work it looks like it goes with the rest of the building, but actually close study of it shows that it's been reset. And in particular, one of the, um, the clues to it is that at the head, it is actually a pointed arch rather than the round arch that you'd expect really until the last uh, couple of decades of the 12th century. And the voussoirs here of the chevron have, have all been slightly messed about and cut about here. So it looks like it's been reset but reset quite early on, and it seems to be part of the, um, the uh, circa 1500 um, rebuilding of the hall. The interesting question in terms of the, the uh, original building course is, well, where did this arch come from? Um, Chevron arches like this typically were the sort of great surrounds to great doorways. So it could well be that the, the principal entrance door to the castle hall, which surely would have been quite an impressive thing, would have had a number of orders, uh, including the chevron arch, maybe these very stones, but it's been reset. One of the useful things about it being reset, and we can be confident that it sort of goes with that 1500 re-roofing, is it gives a wall height level uh, for reconstructions, and from that you can work back to get uh, the height of the earlier building with a little bit more confidence. So I then want to move on to um, uh, the north wall, the opposing gable end wall to the one with the uh, wonderful windows in it. Um, and uh, in the course of the uh, excavations and, uh, and building work uh, in 2019, uh, which uh, you last uh, were doing all the recording on, um, these um, two doorways <clears throat> in the north wall, pair of doorways came to light. Uh, they had um, been uh, they'd known of generally before, but had uh, really sort of rather slipped out of memory because um, on the opposing side, as we'll see, um, it's not readily accessible, uh, that side of the building. Um, the doorways, uh, they're two, two quite closely set doorways, and uh, uh, you'll notice these are actually um, pointed arch doorways. They're not uh, Norman doorways. Um, 
but um, they're closely set. Um, these are probably sort of something like 14th century in date. Um, and the interesting thing is that in particular, the uh, close up here, you'll see, and this uh, detail here, if it's, led, if it's readable, uh, you can see that the doorways were both opening outwards rather than being doorways, they were leading out into a, some sort of enclosed space. And in fact, given that you've got two doorways set closely together, two enclosed spaces, they're not gonna, you're not gonna go into one space. So it does tell you something quite important about the building. This obviously is the building in the 14th century, um, and the, um, my sort of um, uh, take on this is that these must be an upgrading of earlier doorways um, in that same position, though that's um, not entirely certain, but that seems a reasonable supposition. Um, so moving on, moving on to the outside of that, uh, this, this is the uh, side which uh, you sort of see from the garden behind um, Castle House and the judge's lodging to which there's generally no public access. Um, but uh, it, this wall actually, besides the doorways, which we'll look at in a minute here, it has a number of other extremely interesting features. Here's the east part of the building all rebuilt in 1695, here's 19th century building up and so on. But there's quite a lot of masonry, quite a lot of the rubble work um, uh, replaced uh, over the years in, in a more volcanic rock. But interestingly, quite a lot of um, intriguing features from the earlier building. So that's uh, looking closer now at the, the feature of the, the doorways. Um, there's a sort of uh, arch over the doorway and uh, various changes that have been made to those uh, and so on. Like to, I'm going to be talking in particular about this um, weathering course up above here, which is a, a peculiar feature, uh, and also some projecting stones which uh, project from the wall further down. Um, the doorways, when you sort of put those onto uh, this uh, nice elevation drawing from Nick Clee, they sort of fit together quite well. So inside and outside those two doorways coming together, the 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 um, placing of two doorways on the gable end of a hall is something that is extremely familiar. It's a very standard pattern, obviously, of service doorways. You quite often get three doorways all set together, and um, certainly a pair of doorways like this can have no other interpretation other than that they were uh, leading into the buttery pantry kitchen area of the uh, of the building. Um, uh, so that's interesting to be able to piece that together. The other um, intriguing thing, and this is really quite puzzling evidence, is this projecting weathering course up above, um, which is a very deliberate feature. It's in the Danehill sandstone. It's clearly an early and original, I, I, I'm sure, feature. And what that looks like is it's a weathering for an attached building that abutted against um, this gable end. Um, a little bit more evidence of something abutting is these projecting stones. You can see a few stones here. Um, quite difficult in that it, you would have thought perhaps that this abutting building might have been built of timber because um, I've talked, I know, to Pete Little about this and there was some excavation which found very little in the way of evidence of any foundations here. But the building evidence tells you that there was something that had two doorways leading into it and something abutting to it. So it's, um, it's a bit of a puzzle, but um, uh, it, and this, um, rather than being of lightweight timber, might suggest that at least part of it or a buttress of it was of stone. Um, so um, that's the, uh, the overall uh, gable, gable end there looking at this and um, uh, the uh, reconstruction. Um, that I've come up with in simple terms is that there was a building then abutting against this, probably a buttery and pantry and a passageway leading out of that towards a kitchen. I think there's not enough space here with the lack of foundations and sloping ground to fit the kitchen in immediately to this space. Um, but it looks like the original building, if you take it that this, there's, there's been some argument and discussion previously about the service end of the building being at the other end. Uh, but this pair of doorways certainly suggests very strongly that by the 14th century, this was the service end, the services were here. And it would be really quite exceptional to turn the orientation of a building around. So one has to think that um, the uh, 14th century pointed arch doorways are a replacement for uh, some earlier uh, round arched doorways. And just to uh, make the comparable then, this is uh, Oakham Castle, which um, 
I uh, did a detailed piece of research and published an article on some years ago. And um, this has also a, uh, a wonderful uh, great hall. We'll be looking at a little bit more. Uh, this one built of stone in the 1180s um, has doorways leading out of the gable end uh, as, at, um, as at Leicester. And my reconstruction of that again is that um, there were some attached buildings here, probably of timber, uh, but in this sort of lean to style. And again, there's just fragmentary evidence that points towards that in particular, uh, some evidence of sort of corbels that took the uh, timber plate here, a bit like that uh, stone weathering, which is the sort of principal evidence for a lean to building against the gable end at Leicester. So that all leads around to um, my uh, reconstruction of the original plan. Obviously, we've lost a huge amount of the building. We can't be very sure about, in particular, the window positions. Um, but uh, given that there's, uh, we know uh, the number of bays, we have the, the, the two end walls, we have um, doorways here, the two service doorways leading out into attached building. Um, and uh, there are some documentary references later on uh, occasionally to six windows, and it looks like six windows would make sense, one per bay, though it has to be said that the remaining evidence of the stone in this wall, they're rather irregularly spaced rather than a neat um, arrangement, so a few puzzles I'm sure still on that. Um, but what this gives you is a very sort of standard um, plan form for these 12th and early 13th century aisled halls, um, a large rectangular space entered uh, always at, uh, at one end, and I'm uh, taking the view that this was the service and entry end. So this is the low end of the building uh, where the entry was, the services and the kitchen down this end, and then um, a high end of the building where the dais for the Lord's table would be set up at this end uh, and uh, uh, the uh, whole hierarchical arrangement of these buildings, a central hearth, uh, in the middle always and the normal arrangement and there is a doorway in this location but it's a, a, a uh, it's impossible to say it, it's now of later period there are a number of other doorways here which uh, uh, also are, are, are of 19th century date now if one could uh, get in and remove all the plaster from that wall we might learn a thing or two really but anyway there we are this is um what uh, you did you so far? This is in the very typical position of um, where you would have the dais, uh, a doorway leading out. And the normal uh, thing at this time what, for these grand uh, aisled hall buildings, the, um, the later 12th century, is that rather than having the uh, chamber, which was the, the hall was the grand ceremonial feasting court space, the public space, there was then a chamber block, uh, a residential and more private space. And that was usually at this uh, date in grander buildings, a detached building. It was set at some distance away uh, from uh, the, um, the hall rather than being directly attached to it. Uh, quite rapidly through the course of the 13th century, the buildings came together and uh, became more joined up. Um, so this uh, here, I'm saying, is, is likely to be the doorway in that typical position to one side of the dais leading out to the chamber block. And we'll look at that in connection with um, uh, John of Gaunt's cellar in a bit. Um, and just to, this is uh, the um, illustration that uh, we put together for the Oakham Castle exhibition as part of the heritage funded project there. But it gives you a really strong sense. It's a, it's, this is... Uh, recreation of the 14th century, but the 12th century would have been very similar apart maybe from some of the, uh, the decoration on the walls. But it gives you a very strong sense of, of, of how uh, extraordinary that these great ceremonial spaces of these aisled halls worked. Um, it was a very hierarchical space. There was entry at one end. Uh, this is showing the procession uh, for the serving of the, the great meal uh, coming from the kitchen, the lower end, and trooping up towards the, the high table at the high end, and then uh, the Lord and his principal guests would have been there, others standing tables at either side. We're familiar, of course, with that sort of pattern even today from uh, Oxbridge colleges and so on as well. Um, but um, the bit that is rather remarkable is that always at this date there was a great flaming bonfire in the middle, a central hearth, rather extraordinarily um, filling the room with smoke and a louver out at the top, rather than a wall fireplace. 
the chamber blocks always had wall fireplaces. They were places of comfort. It wasn't that they couldn't build wall fireplaces, um, but this was a, a distinct choice. It was obviously a signifier of this great um, ceremonial public space to have this uh, blazing fire with the smoke and crackle in the middle of it. Um, so we then come around to my uh, reconstruction eventually now of um, the, uh, the, cross, the cross section that I put together, which draws very much on earlier work, but adds my own in particular, um, relating it more strongly now to the, to the levels um, uh, rising out of the archeology span and the height of those um, uh, two stone doorways. Um, uh, you can see the, the stepped uh, plinth here and so on uh, out on this side. Um, and um, <clears throat> the other masonry features in terms of the heights of things. Um, so um, we've got obviously uh, the uh, great round arched uh, braces as a principal feature. Uh, the, these huge ones going across uh, the, the nave here, these other ones coming out towards you uh, down the length of the arcades. And this reconstruction now allows enough height also to put um, uh, as was probably the case, and is the case of the comparable at Hereford that we'll be looking at shortly, um, also in the Isles. So it was very much a sort of round arched uh, building. Um, the, um, just uh, a little bit more on this. Yeah. Um, uh, the, the, all of those uh, timbers uh, you'll see have these lapsed joints. Um, uh, again, there's no direct evidence for this, but all the comparables, all this is drawn with these particularly uh, form called notch lap joints, which uh, were uh, the standard type at the time rather than mortise and tenon uh, joints. It's obviously got the clear story above. It would have been a very well lit hall, this with those big gable end windows. There was probably another um, big central window on the north gable and then the clear story letting in light all the way down. Um, one particular sort of um, feature of uh, interest for, for those who, who, um, of us who've been looking at early roofs for some time is that because the aisles are really quite wide, um, you really have to reconstruct the aisle structure with a purlin, purlin running right um, up and down the whole length of the building. Um, it's been a view for quite some decades uh, that purlins were an introduction of rather later years, but actually people are revising that. And uh, in uh, recent times, um, another building we'll be looking at shortly, um, the Barley Barn from the early 13th century at Cressing Temple, the latest reconstruction of that by Dave Stenning has also has a purlin, uh, because the trouble is otherwise you end up with an enormously unsupported span um, on these rafters, and it's just not really feasible uh, for a whole rafter structure that time, whereas putting in a purlin looks like what they must have had to do. Um, and then, of course, uh, what we're also showing on this is the sort of earth fast posts uh, running on down into the ground, as found by the archaeology. That's quite an interesting point, really, because I've been talking about the, the lap jointing and so on of, of all of the braces and referred uh, to Cecil Hewitt, the great um, early timber uh, frame expert, dismissing such things as rather poor carpentry. And certainly compared with a fully framed later building of mortars and tenon, this would not have had all that much stability in its upper structure. It would have been rather weak and therefore was probably relying quite heavily on these earth fast posts uh, for some of the stability still. And that um, remains a feature until you get into the early 13th century, the full adoption of mortise and tenon structures which are able to, to stand above ground without being rooted and getting their stability. Uh, a, uh, um, Richard Harris, another great timber frame expert, had this wonderful phrase that a, a fully timber framed building was something that a giant could come along and pick up and lift up and put back down again. If you did that with Leicester Castle, you then <laughs> a pile of bits. Uh, so uh, it's quite interesting. And it's another indication of this sort of very early date where we're looking at the new technology emerging in the mid and late uh, 12th century. Um, so, and alongside that is the, the, uh, the section uh, going the other way, the long section. Um, the, the unusual thing about this when you put it all together really is that the, the posts are really quite closely spaced. Um, um, the, um, uh, the, 
the, because the uh, the um, sorry, uh, just go back again. Uh, oh, sorry, sorry. Um, there we go. Um, if you look at the um, the braces uh, on the, coming across the main sort of nave here, they sort of rise from this point. But also, so so do the braces uh, coming out towards the um, down the arcade, and that means then that in order for them sort of to fit together in the geometry, you actually need really quite tightly spaced posts all the way down this building. And again, it's a, another indication, really, that I think they're feeling their way forward. It would have been a sort of slightly unnecessary forest of timber here compared with later aisle buildings where you start to get things a little bit um, further spaced out. Um, so now I want to look at um, uh, just to place this a little bit more in its sort of context. Um, the exciting thing, as I've been saying all along about Leicester, is, is, is the earliest standing art hall. So just to sort of set that, it, here, here's a whole um, series of, um, these are the, the principal examples, really, of um, art halls from the uh, late later 12th and early 13th century. Um, quite a lot of them standing, a few of them not, um, with only sort of parts above ground still. Um, and Leicester does really stand at the beginning of this whole wave of really big, impressive um, sort of architectural creations of great halls. Um, it's, uh, it is quite interesting, really, uh, this whole new wave. Um, looking backwards, um, the, there had been earlier Isle Halls, we'll be looking at uh, one in a minute. Um, and presumably Isle Halls were brought in as against un Isle Halls, uh, because you wanted to have a wider span is the most obvious thing in that you needed some intermediate support to get a wider spanning building. Um, but um, it's evident really with the way that uh, if you look at these examples, what they were also doing is really just creating really big, impressive pieces of architecture. And it could well be that um, the aisle structure was something that they were reaching towards, not simply it certainly had a, a clear support function, but it was also part of the impressive architecture that they were setting out to build. Um, uh, this is a whole subject that I've been working on for some time and continue to do the study of early aisle halls, but you'll see there, there's quite a range of sizes of halls and Leicester, as it is you know, a great sort of magnate's place, it is one of the, the larger ones, even though it's an early one. Um, it, uh, they're not quite as large as the Bishop's Palace at Terriford, but the same, uh, same size as um, Auckland Castle uh, up in uh, the Bishop's uh, Palace up in um, County Durham. Um, so what else do I want to say here? Um, yes, the, the other interesting thing really uh, that comes out of this when you look at the range of different examples is that um, some of these um, are built uh, with uh, all of timber, some with uh, timber arcades and stone walls like Leicester and some all of stone. And uh, again, particularly the, the later ones here, like we'll be seeing Winchester Castle and so on, uh, the Archbishop's Palace Canterbury, these very fine large halls into the 30, early 13th century, they've certainly gone all stone. Uh, and the question really does arise, you know, um, are they, um, why are they still using timber rather than moving right into um, using stone uh, and the fully developed sense of uh, creating the best, um, kind of uh, architecture. Um, interestingly though, um, when you look then at the details, and we've already seen that at, at, uh, at Leicester um, in some ways, the round arching and the shaping of the capitals, even where they're building in timber, they seem to be imitating stone. And it seems to be the, uh, the stone architecture, the great Romanesque architecture that is setting the trend for this wave of uh, new impressive structures. So I uh, just wanted now to look um, at, uh, in particular, at Hereford Bishop's Palace, um, which is um, really the, the closest and direct um, comparable to Leicester. It's um, a, a little bit later. This one has been, um, uh, has an actual felling date of 1179, which is very convenient, so it can be really precisely pinned down in terms of its date. It's been studied by quite a few people, uh, and most the most recent interpretation of it uh, by John Blair a little few years ago now. I'd like to go and have a crack at this one myself, I have to say, but we'll do one day perhaps. 
Um, so this is uh, looking at it, and you can see immediately um, the uh, the sort of comparison to Leicester, and really why we have a reasonable amount of confidence about some of the features that we've been sort of saying, oh, it must have been like this at Leicester, because here we have um, the um, great big, um, and this is now direct evidence and some surviving uh, pieces rather than constructing from quite so many fragments as at Leicester, a, a great um, round arch uh, uh, around uh, over the nave, a whole series of um, round arches coming down the arcade here, and the clear story up above um, throwing light in, and there's very good evidence for all of that at um, Hereford. These are photographs of it, as you can see there, this, this here is um, uh, the surviving big round arch braces from uh, part of the nave arcade, absolutely splendid timbers and you can see though here this is uh, the jointing that uh, Cecil Hewitt uh, called rather poor carpentry because they're just sort of lapped in and pegged in and you can see there's you know there's not an awful lot of structural strength and stability about that kind of joint compared with a properly jointed in mortise and tenon um, but it's even though it's, it's obviously a little bit later than um, Leicester um, and uh, it, the architecture is, is moving on into a sort of slightly more sophisticated um, type. The, the carving of the capitals you can see here is really compared with that sort of rather crude, heavy scallop uh, timber capital from Leicester is a lot more advanced. And uh, the, uh, the, the way that it uh, is put together three dimensionally in terms of the height of the springing of the braces is also, as we'll see, um, much different. Here's a comparison of the two sort of uh, uh, to the same scale, uh, you can see um, Leicester is just a little bit smaller, not quite so high, uh, but uh, really quite similar in the way that it's put together. Um, Hereford, it's I, I'm pretty sure it must have had stone walls, although very little survives. It has timber structure internally, uh, so in that sense, it's also very similar to uh, to Leicester. Um, interesting to compare the the longitudinal section. We, commented um, earlier about the, um, the close um, setting of the posts at Leicester. Here at Hereford, um, you can see a more typical way that the aisle posts give much more of a sense of space. And uh, that actually, if we go back again, that is because um, at, um, at uh, Hereford, the, um, the, big, uh, brace, the big arch braces over the nave actually spring from higher up on the, on the column here, whereas the, um, the arcade is lower down. And that in terms of the geometry allows you then to um, space out the post rather than from everything springing at the same point above the one capital. Um, Leicester also um, has uh, other peculiarities about the fact um, that um, if we compare those two that um, it's actually rather kind of illiterate, I suppose, use of, of, of sort of um, Romanesque style. The surviving capitals we have are here, but it looks like the evidence seems to be that there was another uh, fairly fully developed capital up here. So they had two tiers of capital, which um, is a peculiar thing to do, really. And um, the way that it's worked in there, whereas uh, the capitals here are very much more part of the flowing architecture and the way the, uh, the different volumes fit together at, um, at Hereford. Um, this is a, another much smaller example, um, but an intriguing one at uh, Birmingham Manor. Still another example with um, timber arcades, but stone external walls. Um, and now, although small, this is a really very elegant structure indeed, um, uh, with, as you can see, um, really finely carved um, capitals in both stone and in timber. Um, here, again, you've got these uh, big round arch braces coming both um, down the, uh, the arcade lengthways and then also across here, both springing from the same point. Uh, this being a smaller building, that doesn't really give any difficulty in terms of the um, spacing of the posts. Um, so... Um, Um, and then looking uh, more widely at uh, some of the other comparables, we've got there across the top Leicester, Hereford and Oakham, three of the very large fine examples we've been looking at. This is then a series of other smaller, the, the other ones on the lower level there, all timber framed examples um, from the same sort of period of um, uh, late 12th going on into early 13th century. 
and these ones all uh, of timber frame rather than stone walls at all. Um, it's um, interesting though that um, when one looks then more closely at even the, the ones built entirely of timber, um, they have these same sort of uh, features as if they're imitating stone, round arches, carved capitals in the same way. Uh, and they do seem once again to be aspiring towards being stone buildings. Um, so, um, yeah. Um, pursuing that a little bit further, the, the, these are then two examples of um, aisled structures which are entirely of timber rather than any stone. On the left is, um, is, is one of the few sort of well-defined predecessors to, uh, to Leicester um, at Cheddar the East Hall one uh, from the early 12th century, so uh, a few decades before uh, Leicester. Here, obviously, excavated only, and this is uh, interpretation from uh, the evidence in the ground only. Um, but here, it's thought to be just a fairly simple, plain timber structure, and related also, of course, to uh, aisled halls, which had been reintroduced as a sort of building type in England from the late 10th century and a number of other ones around. But um, an interesting strand here about, you know, these then are interpreted like the, uh, the barley barn here, which um, is a more straightforward practical building without round arching or um, a carved capital detail. Are these drawing from a sort of timber aisle hall tradition, something reaching back towards the pre-conquest times or even further back to sort of Anglo-Saxon times? Um, and is this also something that's behind the use of timber still at, uh, at Leicester rather than adopting stone? Um, and that, of course, contrasts entirely with um, what's happening at somewhere like Oakham, where you have a very fully developed, um, fully masoned architecture, probably masons coming from Canterbury Cathedral uh, within the sort of few years of completing the great uh, new work down there coming up here and carving these capitals and a wonderful great light arched structure. Um, it does seem um, really when you, the more you look at it, that the, uh, the, the great ambition for these, this new wave of halls was to be sort of following in the footsteps of the leading architectural style really, rather than just doing something plain and um, uh, functional of timber, but uh, following the, the great wave of Romanesque architecture, which since the Norman conquest had been rolling out across the country. Here we've got two slightly later examples, uh, standing examples of, of great halls at uh, Winchester and at uh, Bishop Auckland, here moving on into a sort of transitional and pointed arch style in the early 13th century. Um, but of course, going back before um, Leicester, the great wave of stone building that was happening right across the country was the great cathedrals, um, uh, the great churches, and actually right down to an ordinary parish level, um, the creation of um, aisles in, in most of the, in so many of our ordinary parish churches. The one in my village of Bringhurst uh, has its own mid 12th century Norman um, arcade punched through the north wall of an aisleless nave. Um, uh, so this is the kind of architecture otherwise that it maybe that you think well maybe they were aspiring to this with their carved capitals and so on. Uh, here's another, uh, there were not just um, aisled halls at the time as well as obviously all the ecclesiastical architecture but at the same time as this wave of uh, new aisled halls there were similarly infirmaries and hospitals in the monastic um, world that also had a huge flourishing from the later decades of the 12th century. And this, although it's now it was later converted to a church and maybe looks like a church and uh, there's plenty of churches that have this same uh, pattern to them, but this has the typical uh, aisled hall-like features of a great arcade um, and then the clear story windows, whole row of windows up above. Um, and then just comparing uh, Leicester here, this is a sort of example uh, from a similar kind of date uh, in stone architecture to that scalloped capital. Um, is, is that what was in the mind of the carvers at Leicester? And, you know, if so, why, why 
if you had all the wealth of uh, Robert, uh, second Earl of Leicester, why not build in stone and do it for real? Maybe it didn't matter. Maybe it was just that it was that it was cheaper and functional and so on. Um, or maybe there's other things at play. Um, it could be that because you wanted a fairly open structure as an art hall, and you were still at the stage where if you were building columns, they had to be really quite heavy things in the uh, and thick, stout things in the um, of stone in the mid 12th century. You hadn't got on to the sort of more elegant, slimmer architecture uh, towards 1200, but it would have cut up the space too much if you'd have put in stone columns and, uh, instead of timber. So well, we don't really know um, quite uh, what's behind it, but certainly the, the timber, like the, the masonry here, would probably all have been painted in gaudy colours, something that, uh, not to our taste perhaps, but that's probably how it was, uh, and therefore they would have been sort of more similar, though they certainly really wouldn't have, uh, have fooled anybody, presumably. Um, one then just to finish off with uh, one or two final bits, um, looking now at uh, John of Gaunt's cellar, um, this lies um, in, uh, down uh, to the south of, um, of the Great Hall, and, and, and its location certainly fits very neatly for the pattern that's been recognised um, of um, a, uh, a great hall uh, from the late 12th century and uh, a detached chamber block for the Lord to withdraw into a more private and residential space. Um, and uh, this location here looks like it could well be that. Though I have to say my interpretation of that, looking at the masonry and getting one's eye in for the original uh, Norman masonry on the Great Hall, I found it unlikely, I think, that the existing stonework here, uh, which is really nice, finely jointed ashlar in, a, in an undercroft underneath uh, what um, would have been a main structure above, I think that more likely to be from the 14th century than with some later um, alterations in the early 15th rather than, but it very probably represents the footprint. Uh, it lies right again on, on, on the Bailey wall, and represents a rebuild on the footprint of what would have been uh, an original chamber block. Um, here we go. Um, and uh, this is uh, the example at um, Oakham Castle, which uh, has been pursued in excavations over several years now, and most recently by ULAS in 2019, and triumphantly found here. This is the, the castle hall out here, um, service end down the far end. There's a doorway that comes out under this um, uh, roof structure now, an original Norman doorway in this case, leading outwards to something out here. And what was found here was a whole array of corridor and pentis like structures. And then finally, uh, in the last phase of the excavation, uh, just uh, where it's being uncovered there, the corner up very probably of the 12th century detached chamber block. So here, this uh, in the Castle Bailey is, is the hall here, entrance to this end, and then going through the hall, and then the chamber block, a detached structure built very probably right up against the castle wall, uh, rather similarly uh, to um, the castle wall placement at, um, at Leicester. Um, I'll just um, finish off then with one or two things about the later development. Um, this is uh, my reconstruction section of, of the, the building um, uh, with the, the roof as it was then truncated around about 1500 and also with the 1695 um, East, uh, East Range refronted here. Um, it's interesting to, to see this really because that's the existing roof that we still have all this great uh, old tree ring dated and really quite nicely put together, typical um, uh, triangulated, more fully mortise and tenon structure. Um, uh, and also this then um, really largely from, because this is all gone, from the Goddard drawing and other information one can piece together really quite accurately the original aisle roof, which had then been raised up at this point. If we look at the, uh, comparing the section, you can then see how the changes were made um, uh, Presumably, um, for some sort of uh, major uh, functional reason, they, the clear story maybe had decayed by then and needed to be entirely replaced. 
uh, maybe there was trouble also with aisle posts and feet rotting and so on. So the whole of the upper roof, um, uh, the original upper roof was taken off in this new roof, but they truncated it, they removed the clear story that was no longer wanted. They built up uh, the aisle walls quite substantially to get up to the height and they, that, it then builds in that um, reused chevron pointed window, which fits neatly under the, uh, the wall plate here. Um, the floor level raises up at this point and uh, the, the the feet of the posts is probably all cut off and pad stones put under them to uh, support the, the rotted bases. So uh, really quite nice uh, clear um, uh, legibility about what happens in that later period. And then this is really quite conjectural, but I thought I'd stick it in anyway. <laughs> I didn't publish this. <laughs> um, <laughs> but uh, just to sort of give a bit of an impression of, um, of, of how the whole uh, courtyard, because there's really quite a lot then as one goes on into the 15th century, a lot of documentary evidence um, through the 14th and 15th century of references to different rooms and so on. And one can study that quite closely and try to piece it together. And that uh, documentary stuff goes right through into the 17th century when things are then in decay, and being demolished and put up for sale and so on. And from all of that, you can sort of see that the hall itself survives, obviously. And we've got uh, the evidence of these doorways leading out but nothing not much space for anything else out here so it seems that this was the service end and the kitchens and so on one of the intriguing things um, is that um, this whole uh, structure of john of gaunt's kitchen which is very clearly described in the documentary references as really quite a, a huge big impressive building of stone built uh, four square sort of 11 meters by 11 meters on plan and there is a footprint <laughs> remarkably of this that survives underneath the brick built bit in the cellar underneath of Castle House, um, which I went down into with Peter, didn't I? And we puzzled over this. But it is rather remarkable that, you know, could this actually be the footprint of, of, of John of Gaunt's kitchen, which is um, referenced in the documents as belonging to Castle House, which is the, uh, the gatehouse sort of structure here. Seems a bit of a long way um, from the kitchen and food went cold, but maybe they put up with that. Um, so who knows, that's a sort of, so all of the, and there's a quite extensive set of, of service buildings by the 15th century, uh, um, sorcery, ewery, all sorts of things that are described there. And then at the other end, and there really was this, um, in most plans are very much a sort of um, hierarchical, one end for service, other end uh, for uh, residential use and chambers, a whole series of chambers. This is the John of Gaunt sort of undercroft structure I put on here, but then uh, uh, probably a whole series of other chambers. and which are referenced as being the dancing chamber and the countess chamber. And again, staircases, pentices leading up, the chambers would all have been on the first floor in those times and so on, uh, somewhat conjectural. And then of course, um, Castle House, which survives um, itself. There was a fire there and then uh, um, that timber, lovely timber series of buildings was built in the mid 15th century. Um, and that survives quite legibly uh, as being really the constable or the, uh, the auditor and receiver's house in later times where the sort of estate office of the great castle, uh, the honour of Leicester and all of the land holdings was managed from. So I think that's the final slide. Um, thank you very much.